Welcome back to the second session of uh, my book, His Treasured Possession, What Kind of People Ought We to Be? In the first part, we looked at godliness, uh, a value for all things. And in this second part we're looking at now, it will be godliness, a value for knowing him. Augustine said, I desire to know God and my soul. Nothing more? No, nothing at all, he said. Let's look at that first part of that statement, I desire to know God. 2 Peter 1.3 says, His divine power has given us everything we need for life and godliness through our knowledge of him. Robert Murray McChain writes, God does not require of us great learning, but great likeness to Christ. That's the outward reflection of his power in us. The inner life of godliness is reverence for God, a God consciousness. Is it because we've domesticated God and made far too little of him and had a small view of him that we don't fear and bow before him? J.I. Packer underlined this when he wrote, real spiritual growth is always growth downward so that so to speak into profound humility which in healthy souls will become more and more apparent as they age as we get older are we growing downwards by degrees are we more humble now this year than we were last year are we walking humbly with god we can't pick humility off a tree we can't find it on a supermarket counter. Uh, we can't buy it in a farm. Humility is learned in God's school. It's the result of knowing the truth about God and his greatness and his holiness and ourselves in our smallness and our sinfulness. That's how Augustine said, I desire to know God and my soul. So let's first look at the statement, I desire to know God. Um, we'll never truly know God in his, uh, as because we're so finite and limited. And God is immense and in all his fullness. We'll never know God in that way. We're like babes dipping our feet in a paddling pool uh, when we come to seek to know God. Uh, so how can we know God? How can we know him better? Well, we need to make one thing clear. Knowing about God is not knowing God experientially in our own experience. John Piper says, God is most glorified when you are most satisfied in him. Knowledge, knowledge about him will not do. Work for him will not do. We must have personal, vital fellowship with him. Otherwise, Christianity becomes a joyless burden. It's like reading a theory test, uh, a theory book of, of your driving test and sitting in an armchair, perhaps with a wheel in your hands. And you go through the motions and you try to drive down lanes and whatever. But we'll never really know what it's like until we get on the road in the car. I remember my husband Stephen being in London at one time and he was waiting to buy a, a train ticket. And at the same time he's reading, he's always reading, uh, he was reading Oz Guinness's book, one, one of Oz Guinness's books. And as he glanced behind, Oz Guinness was standing behind him. And he said that the five minutes he had speaking with the man face to face was more than he, he learned from the whole book. Um, it's not enough, is it, to know just the facts about God. We need to know him for ourselves. At college, I was, I was very friendly with a postgraduate student and he had been a Christian for a long time and I'd just become a Christian. And really through him, I, I learned about the um, doctrines of grace. But as I grew as a Christian, 
I realized he knew so much in his head, uh, but he had very little experience of God uh, in his life. And sadly, he went back into the world and he's nowhere at this moment. It's so vitally important that we don't make the mistake of thinking because we know a lot about God, uh, that it's the same thing as knowing him. Morris Roberts says, to keep the power of godliness in the soul is about the most difficult thing the Christian can do. A violin hung up on the wall soon goes out of tune. So does the soul because of indwelling sin soon lose its spiritual edge and become untuned for communion with God and other spiritual exercises. We betray the neglect of communion with God in private. The vehicle of devotion is, still travels along, but it's obvious that the tires are flat and the whole machine is in need of an overhaul. Well, God can give us that overhaul, can't he? And, uh, but he won't be friends on our terms in the way we just choose to know God. Jeremiah 29, 13 says, you will find me if you seek me with all your heart. We dare not play truant from God's school. So how can we know this God in a deeper and more personal way? Well, to help us answer that question, we ask another question. How do we get to know anybody uh, personally um, in that way? Well, getting to know us, one another, is all to do with contact, isn't it? You cannot have a meaningful relationship if you never together. It's personal. We have to be together. I remember friends of ours in Germany saying that um, there are often couples there who hardly ever see one another in a year. Um, they just see one another on weekends because of work commitments. Well, we can never build a meaningful relationship with such little contact, can we? But I've met some Christians who have the idea that contact with God is almost like a contract. Well, I've got to do this and I've got to do the other and I've got to do um, sort this out and sort that out. And then I'll have some time with God. Um, how can we hope to get to know God in a meaningful way if we're not willing to invest time with him? The danger is because nobody else uh, sees the contact we have with God, we think we can get away with minimal time and still survive as Christians. Haven't you found that uh, just before you're just going to read, suddenly the telephone will go, somebody will knock on the door, or something will pop into your mind that you should have done something that day or uh, that week, or you had a project in mind, and suddenly you're taking up with these things. And before long, perhaps it's time to take the dog for a walk, or it's time to collect the children from school. And as you drop into bed, you suddenly realise that perhaps for the whole of that day, you've had no contact with God. You see, the devil is a master strategist. He'll make sure that we don't have time with God. He'll put things in our way and we're to beware of him. God will not be friends on our terms. You will find me if you seek me with all your heart. So I hope we see that it's vitally important to have that contact with God. And it's for our own benefit, but it's also for other people's benefits. Why do they become perhaps the, uh, the, have the edge of our sharp tongue or a quarrel might happen? Well, it goes back to the fact that perhaps we're out of communion with God. And the most obvious contact with God is through his word, him speaking to us. And then prayer, us speaking to God. What a privilege that we have in those exercises. 
J.I. Packer in Knowing God says of Psalm 139, Just as there are no bounds to his presence with me, so there are no limits to his knowledge of me. Just as I am never left alone, so I never go unnoticed. Living becomes an awesome business when you realise that you spend every moment of your life in the sight and company of an omniscient creator. The prerogative in the relationship is God. He reveals himself to us, but we must seek him. It's very much a two-way relationship. Secondly, as well as contact, there is communion or sharing. This is another aspect of our relationship with Christ. I remember at college having a very close friend and uh, we used to regularly meet together for prayer. And I can remember on one occasion coming from her flat and thinking, I, I've shared, I've opened my heart uh, but I hardly know anything about uh, this friend. So I went straight back and I can remember saying to her, well, do you know, it, it's wonderful to have this friendship, but really it's a one-way affair. And we can't have a relationship without it being two-way. Now, I don't expect you to be like me because uh, I'm the sort of person I, I share everything with everyone, uh, well, nearly. Um, but we had to have that relationship and there had to be a two-way traffic to it. So it's so important that we remember it's two-way. Jesus said, I've called you friends. Everything I learned from my father, I've made known to you. You did not choose me, but I chose you. So just as with friends, so more so with God, we need to keep short accounts with him. We may not share everything with earthly friends and sometimes it's not wise to do that, but with God it's so different. We can lay our hearts bare before him. We can share everything because he, he knows everything about us anyway. And we must be willing to share with him. When we uh, lock God out, we forfeit that communion with him. But no entrance means uh, no entitlement. Our lives are really like, like rooms. We may be willing to perhaps let God come through the entrance door. We may even be willing for him to go into the room with family or health. But perhaps we are not so um, likely to share perhaps the way we spend our money or perhaps some pet jealousy we may have with someone in the church. We are very selective often uh, with what we share with the Lord, but he's Lord of all and the Holy Spirit scans our lives and he knows us better than we know ourselves. So communion with God can be so sweet as it can be with brothers and sisters. And what communion we can share when we are willing to lay our lives open to God and to share with him. Then there's confession. There's nothing like it uh, for clearing the atmosphere, isn't it? Perhaps we've had words with our husband or with our children or with someone else and no one's speaking and the atmosphere is far from friendly. I remember when our children were very, were very little uh, I used to say I wanted to teach them um, about a, a very small word, but it was very difficult to pronounce. But the more we said it, the, the easier it would be to, to say it. Well, what word is that? Well, it's sorry. Which is going to be first to say sorry. Of course, there's if, we, if we're not in the wrong or if we haven't done anything that demands us to say sorry, but then we shouldn't. But there's always a reward from God for making peace. 
And uh, sometimes we can make it harder for someone else, can't we? Uh, they'll say they're sorry, and we say something like, oh, about time. Well, that is, that's like pouring oil on troubled waters, isn't it? We need to be able to help in uh, the mending process. And learning to say sorry to one another or confessing that we're wrong makes it easier for us to say sorry to God and confess to him. And if someone is unwilling to say sorry uh, when they genuinely need to, then it calls into question uh, whether we are really sincerely, we love God. God may even test us in our sincerity um, as to how much we love him and how readily we forgive others. Corrie Ten Boon um, relates how at the end of the Second World War she was speaking uh, at a conference on forgiveness. And at the end of the meeting, um, a man came to the front and he said that he had found God, he'd been saved and he'd come to seek her forgiveness. And as she looked at the man, her mind went back to the time when she and her sister had been at a concentration camp. And she suddenly realised that this was the guard that had indirectly been the means to her sister's death. And her, as he held out his hand to her, her hand froze. And she thought, I can't forgive that man. I just can't. And it was as if God spoke into her heart and she found herself thinking, uh, well, if God, if I can't forgive this man, then how can God forgive me? And she held out her hand to him, really in obedience to that command that we are to love one another. And as she did so, her whole being was flooded with the love of God. And instead of shaking his hand, she hugged him. Well, he can do the same for us, can't he? He can cause that gulf to be filled where we perhaps are not speaking to someone or we are, we are holding grudges. And the same sentiment is shared in 1 John 4.20. Anyone who does not love his brother whom he has seen cannot love God whom he has seen. So it follows anyone who cannot say sorry to his brother, husband, or whoever it may be, cannot truly say God, uh, sorry to God. So confession is good for the soul and brings us nearer to God. And confession is good for the soul because it brings great delight to God. We mustn't allow the devil or our pride to rob us of the blessing of confessed sin and renewed fellowship with God. I quote Maurice Roberts again, who writes so helpfully, pray that God would give you the spirit of prayer, bringing our hearts to God in such a way that we hide nothing from him. We wish to be able to get up from our knees and feel in our consciences that we have exposed ourselves in every way to God. We've laid our heart, very hearts before his gaze. God knows every crevice of our heart. He knows the things we want to keep from him. We need to bring them to him. When we grieve the Holy Spirit with unconfessed sin, then we rupture that fellowship we have with God. And we can't hope to know him better until we put these matters right before him. How many wasted days, weeks, months, years even, have we let slide? Well, if we've done that, then we needn't be surprised if we feel far from God. Are we bitter against him? Perhaps uh, for where he's put us or the circumstances we're in or how he's dealt with us. Just where we are, we can know God's cleansing and renewal by sincere confession and entrusting ourselves again to God's care and keeping power. Which brings us to our fourth C, contemplation or meditation. 
Thomas Brooks writes, Remember, it's not hasty reading, but serious meditating upon holy and heavenly truths that make them prove sweet and profitable to the soul. It is not the bee's touching of the flower which gathers honey, but her abiding for a time upon the flower, which draws out the sweet. It is not he who reads most, but he who meditates most, who will prove the choicest, sweetest, wisest and strongest Christian. Now Spurgeon says that he was never more than 15 minutes out of the presence of God and um, he was never longer than 15 minutes um, out of prayer. Spurgeon was often in God's presence and he was often contemplating him. This was the secret of his wisdom, his love, his compassion, his kindness and all the other qualities that made him like his saviour. We may well live busy lives, but wherever we are and whatever we're doing, whether it's driving, whether it's gardening, whether it's washing the dishes, whether it's doing the clothes, whatever we're doing, uh, we can contemplate and concentrate on God. Prayer is talking to God. Meditating is listening to God. The art of contemplation needs to be revived. Let's look secondly uh, at the second part of our Augustine statement. He desired to know his soul. Now I recall the first time I ever heard the word soul. I don't think I'd ever heard of soul before. But I had become a Christian in my own bedroom and my sister had asked me to go to see a baptism and so I went with her and um, I didn't realise what had happened to me in my own home. I just knew that as I sang the hymns during that service that I was the sinner, that suddenly before uh, when I excused my faults and failings away, I suddenly realised that I was a sinner before God. And at the end of the meeting, I remember my sister saying, do you want to speak with the minister? Because she could see how upset I was. Well, I said yes, but by the time she took me to him, I wondered just what I was going to say. Uh, the church was crowded and the minister leaned over and he said, uh, what is your trouble? And I couldn't speak because I didn't really know what was wrong with me. I knew I was just very upset. And he quietened all the church and he said in a loud voice, this young woman has soul trouble. And uh, I can remember that that was the first time I heard about soul. Well, we can often have soul trouble, can't we? Not in the sense, in the same sense as perhaps I knew it that night. But um, we can certainly know what it is to feel uh, that our, our souls are troubled. And we can lose the felt presence of God to our souls. Now, there are a number of reasons why we may know, uh, not know that felt presence of God with us. Uh, we've looked at one of them, and that's unconfessed sin, which grieves God and, and drives the spirit away from us. But another one I'm convinced of is that we we just don't know our need of God. We we like to go it alone. We like to think that we are able and capable. And we can be so independent of God. His word says, without me, you can do nothing. John 15, 15. Nothing. We can do absolutely nothing without God. And I think we need to learn that lesson. It's so important. We need to pour out our souls to God and tell him our woes and our joys. We need to learn to lean on him. Parker expresses this point helpfully. He says, once you become aware that the main business that you are here 
uh, is to know God, most of life's problems fall into place of their own accord. I'd like to read you a poem that's very personal to me, uh, right down through my years as a Christian, uh, when I've uh, been struggling or in difficulties or under trial. This uh, poem has come back to me and is a great help. Poems called Lean Hard. Child of my love, lean hard and let me feel the pressure of your care. I know your burden, child. I shaped it, poised it in my own hand, made no proportion in its weight to your unaided strength. For even as I laid it on, I said, this burden shall be mine, not hers. So shall I keep my child within the circling arms of my own love. Here, lay it down, nor fear to impose it on a shoulder which upholds the government of worlds. Yet closer come, you are not near enough. I would embrace your care, so I might feel my child reposing on my breast. You love me? I knew it. Doubt not then, but loving me, lean hard. This is how relationships grow and deepen and develop, sharing ourselves with God and he with us. Another reason for soul trouble is that we don't know ourselves enough. We need to weigh up our strengths and our weaknesses. The devil will always drive us to one or other extreme. If you remember with Peter, he said, Lord, I will lay down my life for you. But the devil has other ways of whispering to us and telling us perhaps that we are useless when we grasp our high calling in Christ and we contemplate his power in us and that through him, through him, we can do all things, then we can be transformed by God. I remember um, many years ago now, uh, we were on holiday with friends and uh, the Lord has blessed us with these friends. We've been going on holiday with them for 30 years. Uh, but this first meeting with these friends who had been a friend of my husband's in university, um, I remember I had a, a hormonal imbalance which caused me terrible depression and also a persecution complex. And the week we spent with these friends was a very pleasant time, but because I had this uh, hormonal imbalance, I, I felt useless, I felt empty, I felt as if I was uh, the biggest problem to anyone and everyone. And I can remember at the end of the week saying to my husband, I, I will never go on holiday again uh, with, these, with these friends. Well, the last day of the holiday, I can remember I packed ready and the next morning everyone else was packing and I was sitting at the breakfast table with my, my younger son. And I was just wrapped in misery and um, I can remember uh, my son, my little son, just leaning over, I think he was about four years of age, leaning over and placing his hand on my arm and saying, uh, Mummy, I love the way God's made you. Well, that almost brings tears to my eyes now when I think of that. He just went on with his breakfast. I don't think he, he realised what he'd said, but I knew that God was speaking to me. I knew that he was saying, your problem isn't with other people, it's with me. Do you know, I don't think I've ever sought to compare myself with anybody else since that day. I realised that, that God has gifted all his people in different ways. And we're not in com uh, competition with one another as Christians. We're to complement one another. So those who've been given gifts in one way, uh, Others haven't got those gifts, but they've got other gifts. God's got something for all his children. 
and it's for us to find out what that is. But that day reminded me that I needed uh, to look to God and to be thankful to God for what he'd given to me. The last thing I'm going to look at, which encompasses knowing him, is obeying Christ. Do we do this? As we read his word, as we find out what God wants for us, do we obey that word? Because if we know him and love him, we will want to obey him. The more I love him, the more I obey him. The more I obey him, the more I know him. There are many ways in which we obey God and sometimes um, they are peculiar things to us in our situations where we are. John 15, 17 says, This is my command, love each other. Now that's a command that God gives to all his people, to love him and to love all his people. If we all obeyed this command, then we would be a very united people in very united churches. This is one of the greatest commands that we can obey uh, and a wonderful witness to a watching world. It's the greatest evidence too of our love to the Saviour. I close with a wonderful quote from Jim Packer, which really sums up uh, what we've been looking at. What matters supremely is not in the last analysis the fact that I know God, but the larger fact which underlines it, the fact that he knows me. I am graven on the palms of his hands. I am never out of his mind. All my knowledge of him depends on his sustained initiative in knowing me. I know him because he first knew me. He knows me as a friend, one who loves me. And there is no moment when his eye is off me or his attention distracted from me. And no moment, therefore, when his care falters. This is a momentous knowledge. There is unspeakable comfort, the sort of comfort that energises, in knowing that God is constantly taking knowledge of me in love and watching over me for my good. For some unfathomable reason, he wants me as his friend and desires to be my friend and has given his son to die for me in order to realise this purpose. How much it should mean to us. Not that we just know God, but above and beyond that, that he knows us. Thank you for listening.